Father in heaven, we thank you for uh, these two truths that we hold on to with all of our might. One is that you call us to run the race with endurance and to persevere and to throw off the entanglement of sin in our lives. And we grow weary and we grow faint, but your command to us is to run. And Lord, we desire to fix our eyes upon Christ indeed. And Lord, we also have this other truth that is really our bedrock and that you will hold us as we take these frail, weak hands and try to hold on to you. What is our grip without yours? What is our pursuit of you without your pursuit of us? What could we ever possibly gain without you? Lord, this world is is too dangerous. It is too rebellious. Even our own indwelling sin is too much of an obstacle against us. Yet your grace is sufficient for us as we fight to hold on to you and your promise in your word to us is that you will hold us fast as well. Lord, we cling to this with all of our might. This is what it means to be a Christian. Help us to be one well today. Help us to be the family of Christ that we must be together as a church. And we ask it in Christ's name, amen. I'm afraid to say anything after so far. We should probably just all go home. Because that was amazing, and anything I say will only probably get in the way. But we're going to trust the Lord for that, too. Let's take our Bibles and open up to Romans chapter 3 this morning. That's right, chapter 3. See, you are going to survive this, probably. We're working our way through Romans section by section And we are in chapter 3 today. Romans is Paul's greatest letter in the New Testament. How do you say any one section is greater than another? I don't know, but I just did. It's his greatest section in uh, in his letters, and it's the unfolding of the gospel. It's the unfolding of the good news. It places out in plain sight the contents of the good news of Jesus Christ, of of his person and of his work at the cross and through his empty tomb to save sinners like you and me. But Romans is more than just the content of the gospel unfolded. It also reveals how Paul preached the gospel when he was on his missionary journeys. It reveals to us what happened when he went from one place to the next and preached the gospel in synagogues and to Gentiles outside the synagogues, and it also contains, even in it, the protests that he heard against his preaching of the gospel and how he handled those protests. That's the, really a section we're in today. So Romans lays out the contents of the gospel, but also how the gospel was preached and how it was protested against and how Paul answered those protests. The gospel, the the good news, what we've found out so far is that the gospel begins with bad news. Bad news that you and I must hear if we are ever to be saved by the power of God in the gospel. Romans chapter 1 through chapter 3 verse 20, that's the section we're in, um, contains the bad news of the good news, that all mankind is under sin and under the judgment of God. And it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what your national heritage is. You are under sin, and you are under the wrath of God. That's the argument of the gospel at the beginning. In in Romans chapter 2, Paul revealed the dilemma that many Jews were entangled in when this bad news was preached to them. You see, Israel was a nation of religious privilege among all the other nations. And their view of their own privilege was was warped. And it created a stumbling block before the gospel for so many Jews 
What was their wrong view of their privilege? It was this, and listen carefully. Here's their wrong view. Privilege provided security. That's what they thought. That privilege provided for them security before God, not responsibility. The right view of religious privilege is truly just the opposite of that. Privilege provides responsibility, not security. The fact that you have religious privilege doesn't mean you have nothing to worry about before a holy God. In Romans 2, Paul labored to eradicate that wrong Jewish mindset. That mindset in the mind of the Jew that he was debating in chapter 2 said, I have privilege as a Jew. So, Paul, your bad news about being under sin and being under God's judgment, it doesn't even apply to me. I'm secure. And what we talked about last week is for us who feel so far away from a first century Jewish mindset, We can feel like that has nothing to do with us, but it actually is very close to us, and even in our homes as Christian parents raising Christian kids. Growing up in a home under the word of God, growing up so near to the gospel, having parents who love Jesus and serve Christ, and being in a church that holds God's word up high and central in everything that we do, that is a privilege of a religious kind. And what we all must fight against, but especially what you younger kids must fight against is the wrong thinking about these privileges that you're growing up in. If you think that possessing these privileges provides security for you, you couldn't be more wrong. Possessing religious privileges doesn't take away your sin problem before God. It just doesn't. Possessing privileges doesn't provide security for you. It provides responsibility for you. You see, the real question is, what are you going to do with the Bible on your lap? What are you going to do with your parents' teaching and training of you from God's Word? What are you doing with the truth you hear every week in this room and in student ministries, kids? Privileges like these do not provide security. They demand responsibility. And so Paul dismantled that wrong thinking about religious privilege in a Jew's mind in chapter 2. And the privileges the Jews had were many. But the two that Paul addressed most were the Jews' possession of moral law and circumcision, the sign that God had given to them as a people to set them out apart from the rest of the nations. Possessing both of those meant that the Jew was provided responsibility, not security. So Romans 2 then ends with this Jewish antagonist that Paul is dealing with, this Jewish hypocritical moralist. It it leaves him with his head just spinning in a swirl. Everything he thought about what the privileges God gave him is actually upside down. So how does chapter 3 begin? Is this Jewish hypocritical moralist, is this antagonist, is he now ready to accept the truth about himself, that, that he is a sinner and that he is under the wrath of God? Is he ready to embrace that so that the good news of the gospel can enter into his life and address his need for a savior? Unfortunately, the answer is, is no. He isn't done being an antagonist yet. There is still this hardness of heart that isn't ready to surrender to the truth of the gospel. So verses one through eight of chapter three show us the kind of antagonism, the kind of protest, the kind of disputes that Paul faced from the Jews when he went after their false view of their privileges with the bad news of the gospel. You've come across this. Maybe this was even you. Maybe it's even you today that when your 
life is addressed or when you try to address someone's life with the truth of the gospel that they are under sin and under the wrath of God, oftentimes we're not ready or even willing to embrace that. Some reach for and throw every protest at the gospel's implications against them and even at the messenger who's bringing it. And that is exactly what is happening in verses one through eight. The the Jewish antagonist throws one rock after another at the gospel's implications on him and even throws rocks at Paul who preached the gospel. In verses one through eight, Paul lays down five gospel affirmations to silence this Jewish antagonist once and for all. Let me read the eight verses to you. Then what advantage has the Jew? Or what is the benefit of circumcision? Great in every respect. First of all, that they were entrusted with the oracles of God. What then? If some did not believe, their unbelief will not nullify the faithfulness of God, will it? May it never be. Rather, let God be found true, though every man be found a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. But if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? The God who inflicts wrath is not unrighteous, is he? I'm speaking in human terms. May it never be. For otherwise, how will God judge the world? But if through my lie the truth of God abounded to his glory, why am I also still being judged as a sinner? And why not say, as we are slanderously reported, and as some claim that we say, let us do evil that good may come. Their condemnation is just. What is this passage all about? Here it is. The gospel's five affirmations silence the Jewish antagonist. The gospel's five affirmations silence the Jewish antagonist. And here's the first one. The gospel affirms, not denies, God's entrustment of his word to the Jews. All of mankind, according to the gospel in Romans, is under sin and wrath, but there was one nation of privilege who for the most part abused those privileges. After Paul assaulted that wrong view of Law and circumcision in chapter 2, the obvious question in most Jews' minds, especially in the Jewish hypocritical moralist's mind, would have been a twofold question. Well, then what advantage has the Jew, verse 1 of chapter 3? And what is the benefit of circumcision? You see, the contention goes like this. If the Jews were under sin and the wrath of God, just like Gentiles, well, then what advantage is there being a Jew? What benefit was there in being circumcised? And we might expect Paul's answer as he preaches the gospel to say, none. But the very gospel that declares even the nation of privilege to be under sin and under wrath is the very same gospel that affirms, not denies, that the Jews had an advantage and that circumcision had a benefit. He says in verse 2, it's great in every respect. Well, what is it, Paul? What is the advantage then? Verse 2. First of all, meaning not first in a list, but chiefly, preeminently, especially this thing above all the other privileges for the nation, what? They were entrusted with the oracles of God. This was the kind of privilege that made Israel a nation that had advantage and benefit compared to the rest of the nations on earth. This made them have a great spiritual privilege above Egyptians, Canaanites, Assyrians, Philistines, everybody else. But privilege provides responsibility, not security, right? What does he mean by the oracles of God? The word refers to the fact that God spoke and there was a record of those words written down. God revealed himself to Israel in words a written record, and those oracles were entrusted to Israel. It's the Old Testament. Some would try to narrow it down specifically to the promises in the Old Testament regarding Messiah. That's probably too narrow. But this meant that Israel was to be something then of a safe deposit box of God's self-revelation. But 
That's not a good image. Much, much more was meant by this. They were entrusted with this revelation of God first so that they would what? Believe it. And then they were entrusted with this revelation of God so that they would hold it forth to the nations so the nations could come to this revelation of God. So central to this privilege was the responsibility to believe it. What would it mean if, if, if another nation came to Israel and they say, well, well wait, what do you have there? Uh, it's um, God's self-revelation. We, we don't believe it, but, that's, but we have it. What does that even mean? The Jew was to take this privilege and the accompanying responsibility very seriously. The Jew was supposed to believe it and then hold it forth so that the nations could see and come to them and observe it. Now, I'm going to ask you to be talented here for a moment. I want you to turn back to Deuteronomy chapter 4, but you need to keep your place in Romans because we're going to kind of go back and forth for a moment. So Deuteronomy chapter 4. Verse 7, I want you to see what this was supposed to look like. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 7. Here's what Moses says to Israel as they're out finishing up their 40 years in the wilderness. He says to them in Deuteronomy 4, verse 7, For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as, as the Lord our God? Whenever we call on him, that's a huge privilege, isn't it? Or what great nation is there that has statutes and judgments as the righteous as this whole law which I am setting before you today? That's a huge privilege too, isn't it? But privilege provides responsibility, right? Not security. Look at verse 9. Only what? Only give heed to yourself and keep your soul diligently. You've got privileges. You better watch yourself so that you do not forget the things which your eyes have seen and they do not depart from your heart all the days of your life, but make them known to your sons and your grandsons. You see, this entrustment of God's self-revelation in words was the chief preeminent privilege that the Jews had. The gospel and Paul, they do not deny this at all whatsoever. The gospel may have announced that all are under sin and all under wrath, including Israel, the nation of privilege, but that doesn't mean the gospel denies this privilege of entrustment of the God's word to the Jews. Now, you have to keep your spot in Deuteronomy and go back to Romans. Can you do that? If you have an electronic device, I never know how to do this, but Jacob always tells me afterwards and I forget. So go back to Romans for a moment. But we're going to make our way back to Deuteronomy again here in a moment. I want you to think a little bit more carefully about what God did in this entrustment. This is something to absolutely marvel at. Think about what God said in Romans 1.18. God looked out on all of humanity, the mass of humanity, every nation, and he could only find men and women who suppress the truth about God in their unrighteousness. That's what he found. And then verse 19 of Romans 1, even though God had directly made himself known to them within, they suppressed that truth about him. And that's why the wrath of God is being revealed against them. This is all the mass of humanity. Romans 1 verse 20, God made his invisible attributes, like his eternal power and his divine nature, he made it clear to them through what he made, through creation. He did it without fail. They knew it, all of them. They are a mass of humanity without excuse before him. Romans 1, 21, and even though they knew God inwardly like that, they had no interest in honoring God. They had no interest in giving thanks to him. In fact, the way that their twisted minds worked with what they knew about God only plunged them into deeper foolishness and darkness of heart. Verse 21, that is what God saw when he looked out on all of humanity. It is still what he sees when he looks out on all of humanity. Humanity. 
is a bunch of fools proclaiming to be wise as they reject God. Verse 22, this depraved mankind who rejected God's truth coming at them through creation, they traded off their creator for creaturely things to worship. Verse 23 of chapter 1. And God's response to that mass of humanity was an outpouring of wrath. It is an outpouring of wrath, even current. In verse 24, God gave them over. In verse 26, God gave them over. In verse 28 of chapter 1, God gave them over. All of that mankind was under the present wrath of God. Still is. And what is that mass of humanity like at the the bottom of the abyss of God's wrath? Chapter 1, verse 32, we've pointed this out over and over. They are all cheering one another on, even though they know they deserve judgment's death sentence against them. That's humanity, who knows something about God through creation. And God desired to reveal even more of himself to that mass of sinful humanity. Creation was designed by God to reveal something about his eternal power and his divine nature, for sure. But God wanted to reveal even more specifics about himself to mankind. And it's going to come through his words he speaks that will get written down. And it will be given to mankind. God's oracles would have been given to that sinful mass of humanity at the bottom of the abyss of God's wrath. And you just need to have a full stop and marvel at this. There's not one nation there that even deserves this. What an amazing God. In those words that he will give come the very help and the rescue that this mass of humanity desperately needs. God didn't have to do this, but he does. So which man should get it? Which nation should he pick? Not one of them is worthy. How does God entrust his self-revelation to anyone? Look what they do with the revelation of himself in creation. They suppress it. Why would he entrust written revelation of himself to anybody? Whatever nation he picks, whatever man that God selects will only be a self-described obstacle to everything God wants to do through that revelation. And God chose Abraham, an idolater in Ur of the Chaldees. And Abraham became the father of Isaac, and Isaac became the father of Jacob, and Jacob had his name changed to Israel, and Israel had 12 sons who became 12 tribes, and we have the Jews. Why did God pick them? Was it because down there at the bottom of the abyss of God's wrath, he could see that they were actually on higher moral ground than the rest? Was that why? Not at all. In fact, go back to Deuteronomy one time, one more time, chapter 7, verse 7. Deuteronomy 7, verse 7, the Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you, Israel, because you were more in number than any of the other peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. He picked one man, Abraham. But God set his love on you because the Lord loved you. The only reason he did it was from a reason that was inside of himself. He just chose to love them. And he kept the oath which he swore to your forefathers. The Lord brought you out by a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt.' 
Know therefore that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God who keeps his covenant and his loving kindness to a thousandth generation with those who love him and keep his commandments. But he repays those who hate him to their faces to destroy them. He will not delay with him who hates him. He will repay him to his face. You see, God is faithful in the blessings that come to them and he is faithful in the punishment that comes to them. It's this huge privilege to be loved by Yahweh like this, right? And with privilege comes what? Responsibility. Verse 11, therefore, you shall keep the commandments and the statutes and the judgments which I'm commanding you today to do them. You can go back to Romans chapter three now. You see, Paul's point is that the gospel, while telling the Jews that they too were under sin and under wrath, it also still affirmed that they had a preeminent privilege because God entrusted his revelation to them. In fact, in order to preach his gospel from one synagogue to the next across the Roman Empire, he actually used those oracles to preach his gospel, did he not? Acts records this over and over. So the gospel only affirms this privilege of the Jews. It does not deny the privilege. This gospel would help the Jew avoid the two foolish extremes that are in front of him. What are the two extremes? That Number one, being a Jew makes absolutely no difference in any way whatsoever. The gospel denies that. But the gospel also helps the Jew avoid the other foolish extreme. Being a Jew means I don't have to worry about sin or judgment against me because I have privilege. Those are two extremes that the gospel helps the Jew to navigate between. The gospel affirms the privilege of God's entrustment to his, of his word to the Jews. But what happened to the Jews with that privilege? The same thing that would have happened to any other nation that God would have entrusted his writings to. It's not a Jewish problem they had. It's a human problem they had. They were faithless with it. Secondly, the gospel affirms, not denies, God's faithfulness to his promise to the Jews. Verses 3 and 4. The antagonist is unwilling to bend yet. He questioned first what difference it made being a Jew. Paul silenced that antagonistic question by affirming, not denying the great privilege the Jews had. And that leads the stubborn antagonist to his second protest, which lies underneath Paul's question in verse 3. What then? If some did not believe, their unbelief will not nullify the faithfulness of God, will it? Certainly, the Old Testament's account makes it clear that Israel, for the most part, didn't believe the very word, the, the promises of God to them. And so, in question form, Paul attacks the antagonist's question. And contention. The contention is something like this. Well, God entrusted great privilege to us Jews, and you're claiming by your gospel that we've been a sinful people worthy of judgment? Well, according to your gospel, then, if we've been as faithless as you claim, God's promises to us are powerless. And his faithfulness to those promises is now questionable. You know, there is a sly and devious and sophisticated attack on the gospel and God here. It's like saying the gospel essentially teaches that God's faithfulness to the Jews has been nullified, wiped out. If the Jews indeed are under sin and judgment as the gospel declares, they believe the gospel is an attack on God's faithfulness to the Jews if they are as lost as Paul says they are. And Paul's response is that the gospel only affirms his faithfulness to his promises to the Jews. In fact, he's going to unfold that for three chapters in the, towards the middle of the letter. Look at verse 4. He says, may it never be. That's Paul's strongest way, most emphatic repudiation he could come up with. He, he will not have anything to do with this kind of a charge against God's faithfulness. He's abhorred by the notion that God could be unfaithful. In fact, here's how committed Paul and the gospel are to God's faithfulness. Line up every single liar into the courtroom of God to testify against God's faithfulness. Get all who are full of deceit, Romans chapter 1, verse 29. Find all of the ones who are the haters of God, Romans 1, verse 30. 
bring in all of the inventors of evil. In Romans 1 verse 30, line them all up. Let them all hurl their lying insults against God. Let them throw their inventions of evil against God. And it makes absolutely no difference. They won't win. God will prevail. God will be victorious. And he will be found to be true to his word. Look at verse 4. May it never be. Rather, let God be found true, though every man a liar. And as it is written that you may be justified or vindicated in your words and prevail or be victorious when you are judged. Paul borrows David's ideas from Psalm 51. David was at that point, as you know, in great sin against God when he sinned with Bathsheba. And David knew that God was vindicated even though David tried to cover up his sin with a lie. And God conquered and he prevailed over such lying sin and he was seen to be just by David when he judged. Paul takes that and he tweaks it under his own being led by the Spirit of God and he talks about God being the one turned on and judged and assessed by the liars. And he is vindicated. Bottom line, God's faithfulness to Israel comes out unscathed even though they are faithless. But God in his faithfulness disciplined Israel, and God in his faithfulness carried out blessings on them when they were obedient. When he judges, he only ever prevails against the faithlessness of the Jews, and when he is judged and assessed by the liars, he still is victorious. And the gospel in no way taught that God's faithfulness to Israel was undone because they squandered their privilege and didn't believe. The gospel affirms, not denies God's faithfulness. And this only provokes the antagonist then to his next contention with the gospel, and it's hideous. Thirdly, the gospel affirms, not denies, number three, God's righteousness at the judgment of men, verses five and six. The antagonist uh, continues, yeah, about that whole God being right when he judges thing. Um, God has proven righteous when he judges us to be faithless and liars. You know God benefits from that, right? The contention is. And if that's the case, how right is it for him then to judge us when he benefits like he does? Paul puts this contention forward into two questions. Look at the first one. But if our unrighteousness, verse 5, demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? The idea here is if our unrighteousness, categorical just not being right in the way that we live, sinful, if our unrighteousness makes God's righteousness put forth more clearly, that's the idea of demonstrating, put forth more clearly, well then, how right, this God who inflicts wrath, he's not unrighteous, is he, when he judges us? You know what this is, really? It's just an attempt to try to escape judgment. That's all it is. And Paul's ashamed to even voice such a, a, an insidious contention against God. He, he wants it to be clear as he writes here that this line of thinking is not from him, but only from the fallen human mind. Verse 5, he says, I am speaking in human terms. Warped minds do this kind of thing. Minds that suppress the truth about God in unrighteousness do this. Darkened minds that understand God's very nature but refuse to honor him do this kind of thing. Rebellious minds that have been given over by God in judgment to depravity do this kind of thing. Evil minds that hate God, that invent evil, come up with these kinds of inventions of evil against God. The human way of thinking is to complain against God's character when he judges. That's what's going on. And the gospel defends God's righteousness when he judges. Verse 6, may it never be. Again, Paul abhors the very idea 
that God's righteousness to judge could be even called into question. Paul's point to the Jew then is this. If you think that way, in verse 5, that how can God be righteous if he benefits from judging us? If you think that way, well then, otherwise, how will God judge the world? Verse 6. What the Jew banked on was that God was going to judge the world. He was going to judge everybody else. That's what he banked on. But how could that take place? If this contention is you can't, is it really right for you to judge me? Even though I'm unrighteous, when you benefit from it, could not the rest of the world take up that same argument? and deny the judgment of God. I hope you can see that these contentions are not honest contentions. They are, they are not humble contentions seeking for truth. There is no softness of heart here toward God. These contentions raise a fist against God in his character. It's the sentenced criminal in a courtroom taking one swing after another at the judge as the criminal is being escorted out to the gallows. Blame is being cast on God as, as the antagonist here resists the truth that the gospel has declared against him. And like we said before, this is not a Jewish problem. This is a human problem. This is how hard and unrepentant the human heart really is. This, is. this is how resistant it is to being told that we are sinners under the condemnation of God. The heart and the mind would rather throw rocks at God, the judge, than truly consider the truth before the heart. So can I just ask you, what's been your response to being told by God's word and by his gospel that, that you're a sinner under the wrath of God, a holy God, a faithful God, a, a righteous God when he judges. Have you noticed any inventions of your own kind of evil going on in your mind? You see, the gospel affirms, not denies God's righteousness at the judgment of men. Number four, the fourth affirmation is a short restatement of the third one, the gospel affirms, not denies, number four, God's glory in his truth over liars. Number four, God's glory in his truth over liars. This is essentially the same argument that is in verse, um, that was before it. Uh, but what's different in verse seven? May it, um, but if through my lie, verse seven, the truth of God abounded to his glory, why am I also still being judged as a sinner? What's different with this than what was prior before it? Several things. A different characteristic of God is in view. The truthfulness of God, his glory. Difference in pronouns takes place from a plural our and we to a singular me, my and I in verse 7. A different sin is in view. You have the categorical unrighteousness in verse 5, and now it's specific. It's lying in verse 7. And then there's this subtle shift, too, from a direct attack on God's character to questioning how sinful the sinner really is. The one who's asking the question disputes the label sinner that has been given to him by the judge. And Paul in verse 7, he personalizes the contention, but obviously he doesn't believe this himself. If my lie means that God's truth superabounded to God's glory, that's the idea, if my lie means that God's truth superabounded to his glory, am I really that bad of a guy? Why am I still being called a sinner? Why am I still being judged a sinner? Does that label sinner really fit me if God's benefiting like this? You see, this is just another way for the antagonist to grumble and to grumble about the judgment against him. There's no repentant, soft heart toward God here. There's no pleading for mercy. There's no pleading for help. There's no asking for forgiveness. There's no brokenness that cries out to God to give him a righteousness that he currently doesn't have, but he needs to have if God 
is not going to condemn him. And by the way, this is the way most of us are when we are confronted by the bad news of the gospel against us, isn't it? We don't believe that we should be seen for being that bad. Why are you calling me a sinner? Have you seen this guy? And it doesn't cross our mind at that point when we are told that we are sinners. It doesn't cross our mind to ask the right question. What's the right question? Here's the right question. What is the righteousness that I must have before this holy God whose case against me is settled and closed? What's the righteousness that I must have? How do I get the righteousness that I don't have but that I must have in his presence? And this is exactly where Paul is marching us. In fact, I'm going to take you there now. Go to chapter 3, verse 21. But now apart from law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, those oracles. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. Where do you get this righteousness? Where is it found? It is found through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. That's where the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel by grace. There is no distinction, verse 22, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Being justified, being declared right as a gift by his grace. This is through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. His redeeming work at the cross is the bedrock for this being declared righteous. Where do you get this righteousness? You can only get it through faith in the one who died to redeem us. So you see the gospel affirms, not denies God's glory and his truth over liars, And this leads to the antagonist's last contention or his last protest, his last dispute. If verses 5 to 7 are true in Romans chapter 3, that our categorical unrighteousness benefits God, that my personal lying or sinfulness causes his truth to abound to his glory, well, then why not say, verse 8, Let us do evil, that good may come. Lastly, the gospel affirms, not denies, number five, God's verdict against slanderers of Paul. Paul evidently heard this kind of charge against him and the gospel before. He says, it is reported and it is claimed that this is what he teaches in the gospel, verse eight, but Paul says that this reporting and this claim is slanderous. And why not say, as we are slanderously reported, and as some claim that we say, So Paul then delivers himself and the gospel from such a wicked accusation. What's the contention? Where did it come from? This let us do evil that good may come? Well, as we just talked about, it, it has a connection to the prior contentions. Think about this. The Jews' faithlessness doesn't diminish God's faithfulness in any way. His faithfulness comes out unscathed even though Israel was faithless. Their unrighteousness only put forth clearly God's righteousness. He's benefiting from that. And my lie makes God's truth superabound to his glory? Listen, God never suffers a loss when I sin against him. In fact, he only gains because of my sin. That's where this contention comes from. So in conclusion, when I do evil, good for God comes from it. There's another source that this contention comes from that Paul will address later. It's the grace of God in the gospel. That's where it comes from, this contention, that God saves sinners by grace alone through faith alone. Paul hasn't taken us there yet, but he will soon enough. 
The gospel says this. Think about this. The gospel says where your sin currently is thriving and abounding, the gospel comes to you there and says, don't even attempt to do a good deed to try to save yourself, to try to win God's favor. Simply believe. Believe Jesus' death to be sufficient for you, to save you. So where evil is in your life, salvation good comes forth by grace through faith alone. That is grace in the gospel for salvation, for conversion. But it is quite another thing to take that fact that wherever my sin was abounding, grace abounded more. It's one thing to make that statement. It is quite another thing to turn it into a command to do evil. That's what this is. Look at verse 8. It's a command. Let us do evil with the effect that more good may come. And Paul, in his gospel, never taught that. That is the last rock that is thrown at Paul in his gospel in this paragraph a slanderous claim that the gospel actually gives you ground to do evil with the hope, with the promise that good will come. And Paul's response in verse 8, their condemnation is just. No more could be said to that wicked logic other than God's verdict against them is a just condemnation. There's no question that haters of God who invent this kind of evil against God and the gospel and Paul are worthy of condemnation. That's what Paul says. Again, what I hope you see here is that this is, there's no evidence here in these contentions of a soft heart. A soft heart trying to humbly, honestly get to the bottom of some difficult questions. In fact, that's the one thing to hang on through this really difficult paragraph. Many believe that this paragraph is the most difficult section in Romans. It is truly hard. It is hard to to catch the flow of argument. Why does one question or protest follow the previous one? What was going on in Paul's mind? What is the underlining contention behind the question? Is Paul making the contention or is his question addressing another's contention? It's challenging. But the one thing that comes out that is clear that you must hold on to throughout the whole paragraph is the hard-heartedness of the contentions against God who judges righteously. It's almost like the Jewish hypocritical moralist of chapter two childishly thinks, God, you won't let me be exempt from your judgment because of my privilege. In fact, your gospel turned my privilege against me in your courtroom. So I'm gonna throw as many rocks at you and your gospel as I can as I'm dragged off from the testimony of the gospel against me. Listen, there's no humbleness anywhere in that. There's no brokenness under the weight of the gospel's truth about sin. There is no softness of heart that pleads for mercy from God. There is just rebellious antagonism against God and against the gospel. And so Paul refutes the antagonist with these five gospel affirmations. And he wants to do it now before he puts the exclamation point at the end of his greater section of sinfulness against man in verses 9 to 20. I need to ask you, how's your heart and your mind this morning? How's your thinking toward God and his gospel that has bad news for you to swallow about yourself, that you are under sin, that you are under wrath? What are your own inventions of evil that go on in here when you think about who God is as a righteous judge? Do you dispute how sinful you really are? Why would I be judged a sinner? Do you try to diminish God's character? Do you try to find fault against him? You've been throwing any rocks at any messengers in your life who've been trying to tell you the truth of the gospel. Listen, God, who is the impartial judge, is also the merciful Savior. 
as judge, he is unwilling to change his assessment of you at all. Everything that is in Romans 1 and 2 and here into chapter 3 is true about you, and he will not budge on that at all as judge. But as Savior, he has made some provisions for you as one who is under his wrath. Let me tell you what his provision is not for you. His provision for you is not good works to do to gain his favor. To add religious behavior or to add moral rules to one who is so fundamentally opposed to God, that'll never lead that one. It'll never lead you to self-reform that will be pleasing to God. Lipstick on a pig really makes no difference, right? And neither does adding good works to a life under sin and God's wrath make any difference. He has not provided good works for you to do to save you from his wrath. What has he provided then? Something really amazing. He's provided a a new heart and a new mind, new eyes, in fact, a new you, inwardly speaking. Because until you are fundamentally recreated, all you will be able to do with what you are is invent evil and throw rocks. Until you are born again, until you are a new creation, there's no path forward. And with that new creation, he inseparably provides his gift of faith in Jesus. With new eyes, you can finally see clearly to take hold of his gift of faith in Jesus that he gives so that you can trust in the death of Jesus in your place to save you from his wrath and to give you a new way of thinking about him and a new way of living for Jesus Christ that is pleasing to him. Listen, the the bad news of the good news cries out against you so that the good news itself can call you to believe Christ and to believe in him alone apart from works. Have you done that? Will you do that? Here's his promise, that if you trust him, he will not cast you off, but he will declare you righteous in his sight on the basis of your faith alone, all because of Christ's great redeeming work at the cross. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, your son's shed blood is the foundation for your declared righteousness, and we give thanks to you for your son being willing to suffer under our sin and not under his own because he did not sin. Thank you for putting forth clearly, for displaying clearly, for demonstrating your righteousness through faith. Father, we are so upside down and inside out because of our sin that we, we cast stones against you. We question your label of sinner over us. We fight you to the very, very end. And Lord, that will never change unless you do your powerful work of regenerating us. The gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Lord, grant your gospel its power today in the life of those here today who must hear it to be saved. We ask it in Christ's name, amen.